um, like a day off. So I, I asked yeah, to, I haven't uh, taken a day off. Otherwise, I have to go and get my hair done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you are okay. Yeah. So really, um, well, and uh, it's okay, streaming we're, live now. We're live on YouTube. Christoph, I promised to send you something. Do you want? Shall I send you now? I'm gonna I start screen sharing from my side. Mm, don't, don't worry, I have enough about you. Okay. okay, I'm gonna mute everyone now. Okay.
Okay, the three of you are there. I'm here. Um, Hello. Maybe we don't need Jonathan now, but I will introduce you, Jonathan, in my talk, and then in the Q and A, we'll have you. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll close the video. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Okay, Duran, you and Christoph. Christoph, would you like to kick start or Duran? Um, I uh, are we broadcasting now? Yes, we are live on YouTube and we're broadcasting. Okay, so um, good afternoon for all the millions uh, watching us now. <laughs> or, uh, I would say afternoon, morning, or whatever time it is for you. Uh, Christoph, do you want to say a few words and then I will uh, introduce you in my talk? Sure, it's a pleasure to introduce a good friend, Doron Friedman, who is at the moment a professor, unbelievable, but he's a professor at IDC in Herzliya in Israel, in the Advanced Reality Lab. That's a very nice spot if you want to go on holidays. I recommend Hotel Daniel. And he also did his computer science studies at Tel Aviv University, so the major university in Israel. And then he did a postdoc at UCL in London, together with Mel Slater in the famous virtual reality and computer graphics lab with Anthony Steed and so on. And he was also involved in many different startups uh, in different countries. And he, he works mostly on telepresence, virtual reality, human computer interfaces, brain computer interfaces, and we work together for many years in several European Union projects like Presencia and Vere. And Doron was always responsible for combining DCI technology with virtual reality. And I'm looking forward to his talk. Thanks a lot, uh, Christoph. So I guess I'll try to share my screen. <clears throat> Okay. Right. So uh, I will. Uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to be talking to myself without any feedback, but I guess that's what uh, the world has become uh, right now. Hopefully, uh, we will be over this soon. But today we're here to talk about uh, research and um, so this in my lab in uh, IDC Herzliya. It's actually the first and only private university in Israel. And we look at, uh, we're interested in this human machine confluence, the synergy between uh, humans and machines. And we look at uh, virtual reality as maybe the ultimate display and brain computer interfaces may be the ultimate interface. So we look at them both uh, separately and together. And the agenda for today is as follows. I will assume everybody's familiar with VR, uh, especially with uh, all the uh, talks that <clears throat> hopefully you've heard right now uh, from this series. So I'll give a very uh, quick high level overview of BCI. Then I'll talk about some uh, classic BCI VR studies that uh, I was fortunate uh, to, be, to take part in. And then uh, hopefully we'll have time to discuss uh, what we're more interested in the last few years which is going beyond uh, explicit control. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to discuss this. <clears throat> and then I uh, do hope to, uh, to have people around and take advantage of the live uh, opportunities on both Zoom and uh, YouTube. So you can ask questions uh, during the talk and then we can all have a discussion and try to address them with uh, Christoph. Of course, he's a, a BCI expert and the head of uh, GTEC, who's been very important to this field, and uh, with Dr. Jonathan Giron, my colleague from here from IDC Arcelia. Uh, I will also mention one of uh, the projects, uh, one of Jonathan's projects uh, somewhere in my talk. So hopefully we can uh, maybe even argue uh, during this uh, discussion. So very quickly, you know, this is what we would like to have. This is kind of the holy grail, um, a non-intrusive device and you know maybe like the muse uh, that you see here and maybe uh, you don't even need to type with your thumbs or anything it just reads your thoughts and you can communicate with any device or maybe the phone reads your thoughts uh, as you all know we are very far uh, from this vision 
the reality is more challenging because, you know, to get good signals from the brain and, you know, EEG is the most accessible signal. We'll talk about, about others as well, but uh, getting good signals is still you re requires devices that are obtrusive. The signals are noisy and the brain is very complicated. So we're talking about, you know, 10 to the power of 11 neurons, uh, roughly 10 to the power of 15 synapses. And so, you know, it's roughly, you can say, well, arguably you can say it's about as complicated as the internet is, or maybe even more complicated. And we're trying to figure out, imagine you're trying to figure out what goes on on the internet with a few electrodes uh, from far away, you know, outside the scope. So it's, it's really wonderful that we actually can do something. And, you know, and, and if that's not enough, then the mind is obviously com uh, complicated. And this relationship between the brain and the mind, we want to read the quote unquote thoughts uh, and the, re the relationship between the signals and the mental patterns are not, uh, you know, it's still a mystery. So we do have a lot of challenges. So I think if you're, a, you know, if you're a young student, I think it's definitely a great field to get into because it's definitely gonna be one of these things that's gonna transform humanity but you do have uh, many years of, uh, of challenges uh, in front of you. So very quickly, um, so with humans at least, we're very limited with the type of signals that we can extract. I think that's the main problem we're facing today with, with BCI, with animals, they can do all kinds of things which I'm not uh, going to talk about today, allowing for um, very good uh, control, but with humans, we're more or less uh, limited to these signals, at least non-invasively. And each one, each signal has its own uh, advantages, but mostly disadvantages. So for example, fMRI, I will talk about it, can, be a, can give you relatively uh, good information, but of course it's not only uh, expensive, it's also not very accessible for something what we actually wanna use interactively. Uh, similarly, these devices, uh, EEG and also FNIRS, in theory, they could become uh, low cost and friendly and relatively non-intrusive. Uh, in theory, they're not there yet, but um, because they are measured, the signals are measured from outside the scalp, we have a big problem of low spatial resolution. Uh, these methods, which are not based on direct uh, electrical activity, but on surrogate activity, which is the blood oxygenation level. So you have the problem of temporal resolution. So as you can see, we have, quite challenges with the signals we're trying to, to use. And uh, we do have invasive uh, studies with humans. In fact, I think that's where most of the exciting uh, breakthroughs are happening in uh, BCI. Sometimes uh, when it goes invasive, they change the name to BMI, Brain Machine Interface, but it's the same idea. And um, I'm not gonna talk too much, uh, I'm not gonna talk at all actually about invasive BCI. Definitely, uh, there's a lot uh, going on there, but today it's about integrating with virtual reality and uh, not about these uh, very rare and very extreme uh, medical experiments and interventions. So that would be, that would have to be another talk and less related to HCI and virtual reality. Uh, I want to introduce some taxonomy, which is uh, especially I, I think we should broaden a little bit the scope of BCI. So what I call um, classic BCI is where we use the BCI for uh, explicit control, right? When you try to control a device, mostly disabled patients trying to control a wheelchair or to communicate, and maybe also gamers or someone trying to navigate in a virtual reality. But uh, this is what we call classic BCI and when the BCI is used for explicit control. And then we have uh, extensions of uh, the, the, the field. Uh, then there's passive BCI. I think, actually, I don't think anyone likes this name except uh, Torsten Zander, our colleague from uh, Berlin who came up with it. The idea is that you, the user, are a uh, passive. And the, so you are basically doing a task with an application and the application is responding to your either cognitive state or emotional state. And uh, that's what we mean by uh, passive BCI. You should have a better names for these kinds of things. And then there's of course neurofeedback, which uh, we're gonna talk about briefly. And there's, again, there's the classic protocols from I think the 1970s where you try to up or down regulate alpha. 
and stuff like that, but you can also do some uh, use some techniques which are uh, much more complicated. So of course, the lines between them blurred, but uh, as you see, the, the goal is very different. The goal is for you to be able to regulate specific circuits or, or some activity in your brain, and then, um, yeah, and then have, hopefully have a long-term uh, impact on your brain activity. So we'll start with a classic BCI and together with um, VR. Uh, so as you can see, we're still more or less stuck with three classic paradigms for controlling uh, BCI by thought. And you see that all of them are from the previous century, especially if someone can help me find the uh, older reference for SSVP uh, control. Of course, it's a well-known effect, uh, but if someone knows of uh, earlier BCI work with SSVP, uh, that would strengthen the point. But anyway, you see we are, we are uh, still working with three paradigms from the previous century, uh, motor imagery. Uh, fortunately, we have this human homunculus uh, relatively close to the cortex, so we can distinguish using EEG, um, right hand, left hand, feet, maybe even tongue, stuff like that. And then there's these two methods, SSVP and P300, which, you know, you can think about them a little bit as tricks. Um, although they're interesting, of course, each one, each one of them is interesting, but you can see that, um, yeah, you have these, um, you have these arrows, each arrow is uh, flickering in a different frequency, and you can use them, for example, to move. This could be an augmented reality application. Uh, and on the right, you see a P300 uh, spelling, a classic spelling application. The rows and the um, columns are flickering very quickly. You are attending to a specific letter. When your letter uh, flickers, either because of the row or because of the column, you get this nice P300 uh, ev evoked with uh, related potential. Uh, so these two can be uh, SSVP, the steady state visually evoked potential, uh, which is deciphered from, uh, uh, I, I forgot to say, the frequency that flickers is then very nicely reflected in your uh, occipital areas uh, in the brain, and it can be decoded from there. So it is a pure control of an application with the brain, but it's using these uh, exogenous responses. Uh, you cannot just think about something and it happens, uh, which is more or less what we get with motor imagery. You know, you can imagine your hand moving, for example, you can imagine playing tennis and you see your avatar or your uh, actually playing tennis. So uh, this is why when we started uh, working on these uh, European projects, uh, we were mostly interested in uh, motor imagination and we realized that navigating in the virtual reality is a uh, very good application. And so we looked first of all at uh, motor imagery and we were fortunate to collaborate uh, with uh, Gerd Furcheler from uh, Graz, uh, Austria, uh, who is one of the pioneers of uh, BCI in general and the motor imagery paradigm. Uh, so the idea is that you uh, look at these spatial temporal patterns, both in the frequency domain and uh, certain areas on the cortex. <clears throat> and with a lot of uh, effort and training the subject, signal processing, machine learning, you can basically uh, distinguish, as I said, left hand, right hand, feet, uh, et cetera. And I was fortunate to work on these projects as a postdoc, um, working in uh, Mel Slater's lab. I hope uh, all of you know Mel Slater by now, who uh, organized this whole uh, uh, online seminars. So I think it was probably Mel's crazy idea around 2002 or 2001 that we should integrate uh, BCI with uh, immersive virtual reality. And I was very happy to inv be involved with that together also with Robert Lab, the lead student in Graz who was working on it. And of course, uh, Christoph Wuger and GTEC were part of this project. A lot of the early work on uh, BCI VR happened in this uh, European project. So we had all these, um, kind of uh, projects, I'll quickly show you this video. I won't show the whole video. Could a computer ever read a human mind? By implanting electrodes into the brain, could it access our thoughts, hopes, and dreams? This may sound like a futuristic fantasy, but it's exactly what some scientists are trying to do. Using video game technology, 
they have developed a new way of moving through virtual reality by thought alone. Thomas Schreyer is paralyzed. He broke his neck in a freak holiday accident. I ran to the sea and jumped over the waves. And one of these waves uh, pushed my, my feet uh, up and uh, I crashed with my head on the bottom of the sea. Since the accident, Thomas has been unable to move his arms or legs. But thanks to a new European research project, he is learning to maneuver his way down a street, albeit a virtual street. The cap he is wearing is packed with sensors, which pick up electrical signals from the motor section of his brain and send them to a computer. When Thomas thinks about moving, the computer software translates the thought into a command. The harder he thinks, the stronger the signal becomes. When it's strong enough for the line to cross the red mark, Thomas moves down the street. Okay, anyway, could a computer to the next uh, topic? So this is kind of classic early work. With uh, you know, it's quite amazing that a tetraplegic patient can actually move uh, in the virtual environment by thought. A work from almost 15 years ago, but note this is one button, so it's like a, a, an on-off toggle. Um, Next, uh, at that time already in uh, Presentia, in the Presentia European project, we realized that, um, you know, navigation in uh, virtual reality is cool, but we wanted to go, we thought it makes sense to have a virtual body. Now, let me explain. So the idea is that if you think about it, uh, BCI is by definition a disembodied technology. It's bypassing your body. You, you interact, you know, directly from the brain to the world. And, you know, so it could be very interesting, you know, from a philosophical or scientific uh, point of view to study disembodiment. But, um, well, let me put it simply, we don't think disembodiment is a very good idea. Rather, we suggest re-embodiment. Okay, so early then in Presentia, we already did these uh, first studies where you control a, an avatar by thought. You imagine your hand, the avatar waves, you imagine your feet, the avatar starts walking. This was very difficult. So it's uh, three subjects, you know, small conference paper and then a, a journal paper later on. But um, the idea is that, uh, and by the way, if you see, we're using the cave. This is, these are the days before, um, of course we had HMDs, but um, they were very heavy, very bulky. So it's a third person perspective, okay? But the idea is that uh, today with an HMD, of course, it would be much more uh, natural. And indeed, um, this is a slide uh, from today, actually a video. Let's see this video that I got from, uh, I asked uh, Christoph to share uh, the state of the art. So this is kind of 10, 15 later. And here is what, where I want to be uh, a bit controversial. Again, we can argue and discuss about it in uh, Q&A, but I think this is maybe the first and only BCI product, something that is actually used by people, uh, not as a scientific experiment. Sorry for this. Um, yeah. So what you see here is patients, uh, stroke patients, for example, who have limited control of their limbs. And let's say that uh, ideally you should be wearing an HMD. So you get this very uh, nice closed loop where your brain believes that you are controlling your limbs perfectly uh, using the virtual reality, even though you're not. And so it's not unlikely, and there is good evidence, growing evidence from several groups around the world, that this was, could contribute to the rehabilitation process. The brain sees that it can move the limbs, believes it, and finds a way to do it, and maybe to uh, short circuit some uh, uh, brain activity, etc. Uh, again, very promising, um, and maybe one of the few uh, success stories we have uh, so far with BCI. And uh, I'm happy that it's uh, related to this work uh, that started many years ago in these European projects. So then, if you uh, between the lines, you can see that. Um, 
I was very frustrated with, with EEG as an input signal because, you know, of course, the fact that you can allow patients to, to try to use it is incredible, but the, you know, the noise, the signal to noise ratio and the bit rate you can extract is very uh, challenging. So when we had another uh, European project, uh, we thought outside the box. And here again, I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, Rafi Malach, who is an amazing uh, neuroscientist in the Weizmann Institute with a, basically an fMRI in his backyard. And most of what I'm going to show next is work by uh, Ori Cohen that was part of his, that was his B, uh, PhD. So a very good student working for several years. And we said, why not do uh, BCI with fMRI? And of course, the usual response is that people thought we were completely crazy. You know, the first claim is that it's too expensive. Well, you know, with the whole field going invasive, I think, you know, uh, surgery, either ECOG or, uh, you know, or chronic implants are definitely not going to be cheap. So definitely it's worthwhile to use fMRI to ask questions about uh, BCI. The next claim was that it's too slow. Well, I'm going to hope, I hope I will show you that um, with uh, Ori's uh, excellent engineering, we were able to do things that probably would be impossible with EG. And maybe, unfortunately, we haven't done that, but we haven't done a, a head-to-head -head competition, but we may even beat uh, an EG BCI uh, because we have more information in the fMRI. And then, of course, one of the best things about fMRI is that we have a whole a coverage of the whole brain simultaneously. So um, yeah, actually, it's fine. Um, imagine that uh, even with invasive BCI, you have uh, you only cover very specific areas. And with fMRI, you can see what's going on uh, basically throughout uh, right hand or his feet. So now I'm going to quickly show you some parts of this uh, video of one of the special operations that we did. This is the first stage. This is the training stage uh, where you control an avatar. So this is training both for the subject who's lying in the fMRI and seeing this. Of course, this is not immersive virtual reality. It's a non-immersive virtual environment displayed uh, in the scanner. Um, and so this, in the training stage, the subject controls trains to control the avatar, and the machine learning trains to figure out, um, you know, these, uh, in this case, three classes, left, right, and forward, uh, two hands and feet. Now, in the second stage of this experiment, uh, what you see is the subject in Israel lying down in the fMRI scanner and controlling a robotic body, which is in France, this uh, humanoid robot uh, from the group of uh, Abdel Khedar in Montpellier. And so you imagine that in a sense, your, yeah, your brain is in Israel, your body is in France, and you see through the eyes of the robot, this is what the um, participant, the subject sees. And you have to perform all kinds of tasks. In this case, first task is to follow a shape of an eight to make sure the subject can turn. And then at some point we hit this red uh, teapot somewhere in the room. So again, you, are, uh, you have to control a robotic body by thought using telepresence and then look for this red teapot in a, a different continent. Um, and this is, what we, this is what we think of as a BCI re-embodiment. Okay. So how does this work? So uh, fMRI gives us uh, relatively uh, superior temporal resolution. Uh, what you see here is, um, you know, still averaged over, I would say, probably 40 trials. So, uh, you know, on 40 trials, you get a very nice signal to noise. Uh, if you're looking for a single event, uh, which is what we did, of course, with BCI, uh, it's much more noisy, it's a challenge. But uh, with uh, Ori's system, we were able to reach a uh, very good accuracy, very close to 100% in most tasks. Um, so we actually built this whole um, system, which I think is uh, somewhere on GitHub, if people are still getting into this field and maybe uh, some parts can be resurrected. Um, so what you see is in the training stage, there's a lot of pre-processing, filtering, 
uh, <clears throat> and then there's um, a simple feature, feature extraction, feature reduction, and we use information gain to find the voxels with uh, enough with the interesting information about distinguishing between classes. And then this is sent to a, an SVM classifier. And then in real time, you can use the same models trained offline and integrate this with, you know, it's fully integrated with Unity, but can also be uh, used to control robots as you've seen. So why is this interesting? So first of all, from BCI point of view, let me show you this video um, towards the end of the project. So what you see here is, first of all, you see a bigger robot, uh, again, from Abdel Khader's uh, group uh, in France. And what you see here is something that I think is very uh, rare in the BCI world. It's a seven class BCI. And again, this is not seven, seven arbitrary um, SSVP uh, frequencies, you know, which has been done, of course, but this is seven uh, meaningful uh, mappings between uh, mental patterns to uh, operations. So there's four classes for navigation, uh, left, right, uh, forward, um, and stop. Uh, you see this guy, the experimenter doesn't trust us, so he moves the chair, but uh, um, it kind of works. So what you see here is the, the subject controlling the robot, and uh, there's very good control, and on the right, you see uh, how things look like from the point of view of the subject lying, lying down in the fMRI. And now here, so these were four classes, but after the navigation, you get an instruction about which object to select from this table. Okay, so you see, so the, in this case, you're instructed to choose the face. Okay, this is because we wanna know that you uh, did correctly, so we tell you what to choose. And you can see that all three objects are on the table and in the frame. So it's not based on eye tracking or anything. It's based on actually extracting from the brain the object that you are uh, mostly uh, focused on, okay? And eventually the robot uh, points to it and, um, you know, with some more work, of course, can grab it and start doing things with this object. So, and the interesting things again is that, um, <clears throat> so these uh, three categories of objects, you know, houses, tools, and faces, are of course recognized uh, from high level visual areas, uh, which are well known in uh, fMRI, but our, we did not have to configure the system to do it. It's just in the class, it's purely data driven. The system finds the voxels that are most informative and indeed it goes to the uh, motor areas to find the uh, uh, motor commands and to the high level visual areas to find these uh, object category commands. Next. Next, there was a study uh, with uh, amputees. And in this case, we told the subjects, so there were uh, three amputee subjects, four controls, and we told the subjects, look, you are allowed to use your uh, fingers, you know, again, mostly uh, left, right, forward to navigate uh, this uh, not uh, trivial track inside the forest. And um, so use your thing, move your fingers and your toes to move forward and left, and right. But of course the amputee subjects did not have uh, one of their hand. One of the hand is missing. And uh, what you can see is with fMRI, you can start asking very interesting questions. So first of all, they are able to do it. I will show you uh, some results, but then you can ask questions about what happens uh, to, this, uh, to these brain areas after such a trauma, such as amputation. Uh, all of them were more than one year after amputation. The question, can you still use a BCI? And if you look at these uh, flattened brain images on the left, so you see the bottom is a control subject. You see that the left and right are quite symmetric. And again, we're not going to get into a, a neuroscience, but even if you're not neuroscientist, you're not used to look at these uh, fMRI uh, figures, you can see that um, for the amputees, the patterns are not, are not symmetric and they're not similar to um, you know, the patterns of, uh, of an able-bodied person, but nevertheless, there is enough information for both uh, hands, even the missing hand, and certainly enough for a close to a 100% classification. Uh, eventually, the classification rate was close to 100%, both for controls and amputees, and you can see uh, the trajectories that they were able to perform, uh, including speed, not only uh, reach uh, quite far down the uh, the trajectory, but also uh, slowing down before corners, speeding up uh, in straight lines. Um, so again, the advantages of fMRI is that it allows us to ask all these questions 
that we cannot, uh, what are much more easy, much more difficult to, to, to ask with uh, signals such as uh, EEG. Uh, one more example, uh, and this is not at all related to virtual reality, but I do want to mention this study. Uh, so this is uh, what you see is, um, this is work by Tal Armelech, again with uh, Rafi Malach. This was a collaboration with the Rafi Malach's group. And again, without getting uh, deep into uh, brain science, I want to give you the highlights of what's going on here. So in this case, this is a neurofeedback. You just tell subjects to uh, control uh, certain regions of interest in the brain, but using fMRI, you can uh, choose very specific uh, regions. And what you see here on the y-axis, you see how good people are at controlling this brain area. And you can see six uh, brain area areas, and you can see a very nice pattern. First of all, of course, there's a huge difference. <clears throat> some areas are easy for people to control and some areas are impossible for subjects to control, at least using our uh, neurofeedback paradigm uh, with auditory uh, feedback. And moreover, this, um, the, you know, how good you are at manipulating a specific or regulating a specific brain area is correlated with uh, its place in the hierarchy. So, uh, places like uh, early visual areas, V1, V2, regions in the brain, uh, these were almost impossible or impossible to control, whereas high level brain areas were much easier to control. So you see the first uh, five uh, areas are basically moving up uh, the visual pathway and the IPL is part of the default mode system. Again, not getting into uh, too many details, uh, what is considered a high level. Uh, brain area. So these are the kind of things we can start thinking about in BCI, like what is easy and what is difficult. Uh, some mental patterns are obviously easier for people uh, to regulate. And uh, fMRI neurofeedback as allows us to ask these uh, questions. Right, so until now, I was discussing uh, controlling you know, navigation, controlling avatars and a little bit around it. Uh, re-embodiment. Uh, of course, you can study, and we did study disembodiment, or um, I would say supernatural scenarios. It's terrible loud. Wait one minute. Okay, so um, in this case, this is, I guess you'd call it telekinesis. So again, these are the days before uh, Oculus, so it's a, uh, you know, a power wall, shutter glasses and stereo projection, and you're in the star field and you can control some of these stars using SSVP. So if you look here on the right, you see a classic SSVP experiment from our colleagues in Italy in the same, uh, same uh, European project. But you see, we find these um, squares or arrows quite uh, annoying. And therefore something that we haven't seen enough is basically we have this unity code that allows you to turn any Unity object into an SSVP target and basically control it directly with uh, SSVP. This is Jonathan's work. Uh, I mentioned Jonathan will be uh, joining us uh, for the Q&A and I, I think I'll have more to say about this uh, study. Okay, quickly moving on. Right, by the way, this was also a collaboration with an artist called Miri Segal and um, another collaboration with a, a, an artist called Daniel Landau. This is, um, I don't even know the Latin world. Uh, this is not telekinesis, this is actually controlling other people's bodies. So you see this uh, subject who's actually uh, paralyzed in a wheelchair is uh, using motor imagery of hands and feet to control uh, these vibrating devices on the bodies of the dancers, kind of trying to control their bodies. So again, for us, uh, all, the, all these projects working with artists are really good when we try to understand uh, interaction paradigms, the limits of the of BCI. Of course, later on you have to follow them with rigorous uh, experiments and with you know maybe better engineering. But there's I think there's a lot more to do in in, in these uh, spaces. Um, and then okay, let me show you at the Advanced video. Virtuality Lab in Herzliya, Israel. Researchers are pioneering technology that will enable us to control computers and even a virtual body using only the mind, a power some might call godlike. 
the lab actually uses a brain control. Oh, not sure what's going on here, but concentrate on that red block. I mean, really think about it. Okay, here's the point. So, um, you play this game, and you know it's a really fun video game. So, in fact, what's not very well shown in this video is you control this uh, puck with your hands. You know, using a keyboard. You move it left and right to make sure that um, the ball doesn't drop. But, oh, sorry. But Try using your brain to break the blocks. Kind of blocks that you can only explode using SSVP. So this is what we call a hybrid uh, interface. And um, it's really fun and it really works. And I think we should see uh, a little more of that because you know SSVP is so robust that you can actually do it. You can perform a task and use the brain as another, like as a third arm, if you will, or as a third uh, control channel at the same time. Okay, quickly, let's go. Okay, so these were comments about um, explicit control of uh, virtual reality, kind of classic BCI. Uh, of course, there's uh, many more studies done by other uh, fantastic researchers in the field, which I didn't review. Um, but uh, next, I want to go into the more uh, kind of exploratory <clears throat> domains. And for example, you remember this uh, study where I showed you uh, with the star field. So Jonathan did uh, something very uh, clever in his uh, master's uh, project. Uh, he realized that this effect works even if you're not trying to. Uh, you know, SSVP is again, is a very robust effect. You're attending to some flicker and we get a resonance in your uh, occipital uh, electrodes. And so what he did is he basically put people and we told them, look, and you know, we're talking, uh, well, even now, a lot of people, most of the students haven't heard about the possibility of BCI. So we say, look, you're gonna be in this uh, movie or uh, experience, and we're gonna measure your brain activity. And please try to guess, why are some of these stars moving towards you and exploding? Some of them do and some of them don't. Try to guess why. And without telling you, uh, you are of course controlling them with an SSVP. So, th so this can be considered a quote unquote unconscious a BCI, and then Jonathan did something even more clever and he found out that afterwards, so he had two conditions, one group who did this unconscious BCI and another group who got a sham, uh, they didn't control anything. And then he showed that the guys who were actually uh, training unconsciously to control a BCI were better at performing a task with the SSVP. Uh, so of course this uh, study needs to be uh, repeated, I, I guess, because it's a very uh, dramatic uh, finding. Again, unfortunately, a relatively slow, stu a small study published in a conference paper, but I think again opens up uh, many possibilities. And in fact, we did, we did go and uh, look at it more uh, rigorously using the neurofeedback and the fMRI and the collaboration with uh, Rafi's group. And uh, Michal Ramot, and again, one study that I'm going to talk about that has no uh, VR in it uh, altogether, but still I think is worth mentioning. So Michal Ramot was an outstanding uh, postdoc at the time, now a PI. And uh, what she did, I will explain again um, informally and from the point of view of the subject. Okay, so you're a subject, you go to uh, attend, take part in Michal's uh, experiment. And you go to the scanner and you lie down there actually five days in a row, uh, quite boring. And you hear two types of sound. One sound is pleasant, it's kind of a winning uh, sound, maybe like a slot machine. And then you're told that you get uh, more money, more uh, one more shekel, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, 30 cents. And then there's a, an annoying sound and whenever you hear it, you lose money. And we make sure you're awake and, and uh, everything, but it's quite boring. You have no idea, why, again, why you're hearing these sounds. Uh, but And in the end of each day, you're told how much money you, you received. And then uh, by the end of the experiment, uh, we ask the subjects, um, why do you think um, sometimes you got more money, sometimes you got less? What, what do you think happened? And they said, well, you know, we thought it was ar arbitrary. And we say, no, actually you could control it. Do you know how you controlled it with your brain? And of course the answer is no. And well, to make a long story short, uh, what happened behind the scenes is that uh, the subjects, the uh, 
rewards were connected to two uh, region of interest, uh, again, well-known areas in the visual area, houses versus faces, one of them to get more money. So basically look at the difference. And if you upregulate one relative to the other, you get more money. Other case, you get less money. And Michal showed very nicely that, first of all, most of the subjects, not all of them, most of them were able to uh, regulate correctly and make more money than you would consider in a chance level, uh, even without knowing. So again, unconsciously controlling uh, high level visual areas. Uh, and moreover, and again, you can read the whole paper for more details if you're interested, there were some interesting findings in the um, uh, pre and post uh, resting state analysis of, uh, of the brain. So again, uh, an example of uh, using uh, fMRI, we can aim for uh, very, very specific interventions uh, in uh, people's brains, kind of expanding the field of uh, BCI. Now, uh, the other thing I want to say, we did write about it briefly in this uh, BCI for Real uh, workshop uh, that we had. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, so of course you can use brain computer interface uh, for science, but um, for many people, BCI is first and foremost an applied field want to help uh, patients or you know or allow people to control devices etc and so my uh, the way to put my uh, suggestion is as follows you know the field as you saw is is not very new it's been around something like 30 years okay so we've been doing bci for 20 or 30 years now in the early days it's fine to show that you can do something with bci it's quite incredible and it's worthwhile doing but i think today if you want to move the field forward, especially if you want to do things that are applied, I encourage uh, people to uh, show me and convince me, me and themselves and everyone, of course, not only that you can do something with a brain, but that you can't do it in any other way, especially that using uh, EEG. You know? So EEG, of course, it's not very comfortable. Uh, if you look around, you, I would bet very, no one is wearing EEG. Um, it could be, you know, if there's a killer application, maybe people would wear uh, EEG-based BCIs, but we don't see it uh, um, coming. And so I think, yeah, the point is, prove to me that it's better to use the brain and you can't get the same results without using the brain because most other signals are easier to extract. And this is why um, I think I will wrap up in... Uh, something like five minutes, I hope, but I do want to make a few more points. So in the last few years, what we built in the lab is this diagram. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm really proud of this diagram, uh, but uh, so tell me afterwards if you think it's terrible. Um, what, we, what we see here is that we, um, we record everything that happens in the virtual reality and everything is synch synchronized, of course, a lot of time series. And then we record, uh, of course, not only all the events in virtual reality, but also time series. So we record a scale or a, you know, a subjective report. So for example, we wanna study uh, fear or stress or uh, emotional uh, state. Then we sometimes during the experiment, let people use the controller to indicate their uh, level of uh, stress, for example, or uh, if not, then we can do it uh, post hoc. But so we get a time series of subjective reports which can be used uh, for labels, as labels. And then we extract uh, autonomous nervous activity, ECG, skin conductance, respiration, head motions, uh, audio, which I'm not gonna talk about at all today, but of course uh, could be very, could include lots of uh, useful information. Each signal is processed uh, separately. And then uh, together you extract a lot of features and you can feed it into a machine learning either trying to see what happens in specific events or trying to predict subjective uh, reports. Let me quickly show you an example um, of a study that we are actually uh, wrapping up right now. Um, so we have a, a job interview and um, in a virtual reality, an immersive virtual reality. And um, again, this is part, this is actually, um, so I don't have the logo, this is funded by Joy Ventures um, in Israel. And the idea is to uh, develop um, futuristic technologies for combating uh, stress 
or in general neuro wellness. So we thought, what could be stressful for the students, um, what, which are you know our subjects, and one of the things is job interviews. And so we put you in a kind of realistic job interview, and but notice, so we're not using very extreme uh, stimuli. So it's only nuances of stress. And then the whole scenario is interactive. Um, there's, I guess, one of the things we're interested in is in having continuous monitoring of your level of stress uh, with relatively good temporal dynamics. And this is why we cannot more or less uh, use uh, heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is well known to correlate with stress, but it's a very slow uh, pattern to, to trace. So, you know, usually traced over several minutes. Uh, you know, you could look at 20 or 30 seconds uh, windows, but uh, we wanted a better uh, resolution. And then, of course, there's a problem of a ground truth. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem in these so-called passive BCIs or effective computing challenges, because people are not very good uh, reporting their uh, subjective uh, emotions, feelings, state. Uh, in this case, we, used a, we still uh, try to predict uh, reported stress. Uh, and so there were 28 participants. I'm going to show you very quickly some results. 28 participants, 18 questions, and you know, only a third of them were uh, supposed to induce stress. So we wanted to see the stress fluctuate during this seven minute, uh, or, yeah, roughly seven minute experiment, experience. Um, and um, so th these are the results quickly. So what you see first is that this is subjective uh, reported stress average and in blue, you can see the variance. So yes, there's a large variance between the subjects, but you can definitely see, and by the way, uh, some of this is statistically significant. There's a statistical, uh, statistically significant difference between several questions that were clearly higher, uh, induced higher stress, as opposed to other questions that did not. So that's the first thing, which is good that we can uh, manipulate stress. The second is, thing is that we try to see which of these um, features that we extracted from uh, the physiological signals was most correlated with um, reported stress. And as you can see, we looked at respiration, skin conductance, physic, tonic components, uh, respiration, all kinds of features extracted from heart rate. Again, to make a long story short, there were only two uh, features that were um, significantly correlated with reported stress, um, the minimum uh, heart rate and heart rate deceleration, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, they are, of course, very much uh, intercorrelated between them. Uh, they're measuring more or less the same thing. And so we use a heart rate deceleration, which is uh, more or less what you see here. Here's an example from a stressful, oops, sorry. Here's an example from a stressful question, stress-inducing question. You see this very nice deceleration, uh, missing a heartbeat. And here's a question that did not induce uh, stress. So this feature was found uh, most in informative, a 0.6 correlation, which is quite good for uh, such a psychological construct, but this is not, this is averaged over 28 participants. Now the question, can you turn this into a BCI-like interface? Can you de detect stress uh, momentarily? And uh, if you look at this, this most informative uh, feature, over time, uh, over all events, 18 questions, 28 subjects, on a single trial basis, the correlation is still statistically significant, but you see that it is very low. 0 0.12 is only slightly better than chance, so we cannot uh, use it for ongoing stress management in a BCI-like uh, fashion. Uh, so you could say, okay, why don't you take all these features, throw them together into a machine learning classifier, well, we, you could try. I suspect you wouldn't get uh, much progress because we actually tested this with a regression. And uh, here's a kind of regularization that you can do. Uh, it's called lasso uh, regularization. Basically, what you're trying to do is make sure that these betas are uh, as small as possible. Um, and in fact, they all become zero uh, if, they are, uh, if their variables are uh, redundant. And indeed, the results, as you can see here, is that the lambda, uh, the regularization, was very, very uh, high. 
meaning uh, basically what happened in this uh, data for the data we get, all betas become zero except the beta uh, for this uh, heart rate deceleration feature. So it's kind of telling us that uh, in this case at least, uh, and under assumptions of linearity, uh, only this feature is informative and we will not gain anything by adding uh, more features. Of course, I think moving forward, I would uh, I would add maybe EMG, uh, which of course uh, could contain a lot of uh, information. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying it's uh, it's quite a channel. And I'm not sure EEG uh, will help uh, in this case. Uh, but this is a long story that we will not uh, get into. Um, what I do want to show you as a last, uh, well, you know what, maybe I'll take three more minutes. Anyway, I'm talking to myself, you know, I can't, I can't see anything. I don't know if there's any people here on Zoom or YouTube or if I'm talking to myself. Maybe Jonathan is awake, maybe not. Um, but anyway, so I'll take uh, two more minutes. And one of the, so one of the things we're trying to do is uh, automatically scare people based on their physiological responses. Uh, work uh, led by Karen, a student in the lab, and uh, a very uh, impressive study, which is almost completed just before the corona. Uh, I'll show you a sneak preview. This is really informal video captured naturally during the pilot. So, you know, this is, um, we try to scare people using all kinds of uh, stimuli to spiders, and, and they have to report, using this scale, they report the subjective fear. You know, claustrophobia, spider, snake, fear of height, etc., etc. And then, um, yeah, again, a sneak preview. Is that really a lot? <laughs> Oh, sorry, I insist on trying to, to watch that. Is that really a lot? <laughs> so this is not fair. Oh this is a real uh, uh, pilot study with a participant, of course, oh, okay. this video. No, 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 they're not coming to me. <laughs> Jesus. How? Okay. That was a good one. Intense. Really that, intense. Um, then she, of course, turns the story, uh, to the top. So the question is, um, can you automatically scare people using machine learning and physiology? And the answer is yes. Hopefully, we'll be able to complete the study after the corona. So, uh, some early results are published. Um, of course, if we can scare them, hopefully, we can also, uh, you know, uh, develop all kinds of relaxation protocols. Of course, our intention is not necessarily to scare people, uh, but to make them feel better. Um, and I do want to make uh, this comment uh, before concluding. Um, so yeah, so I think, again, as I said, BCI is an amazing field to be in. I think it's definitely one of these things that at some point will revolutionize everything. But we are, sometimes we have the feeling that it's going very slowly. So one of the things that we try to do is, is a, have a larger audience. And so you see back in 2013, we had the first brain hackathon with, organized by Hamutal and Meridor, the amazing. And, we, and you see in this hackathon, we had a, you know, the head of Google Israel or Google R&D or whatever. We had uh, Muse, Ariel, uh, we had uh, Steve from, uh, we had Starlab people, we had um, GTech people, and we had hackers and we had scientists and we put them all together. And I think these are, uh, these activities are very important to start uh, getting outside of the box. And finally, and this might be a question to you, but I think Silicon Valley is, the, on the left you can see Silicon Valley hackers. We talked about the hackers. Um, but you know that at least we have this guy uh, called Elon Musk who's not only trying to send uh, space shuttles, but also uh, working on a very ambitious uh, BMI project. And some rumors, I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't been following what's going on in Facebook, but my understanding is that these guys are putting uh, serious uh, efforts uh, into uh, making progress. And I think it's interesting. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, both of them are uh, actually um, doing the same thing that I was advocating much earlier, which is try to work out new signals, right? They're not using EEG, they're not using fMRI, they're trying to create uh, new signals, better signals for uh, future BCIs. 
So that's where, where I think uh, we need to go. You know what, I'm gonna skip the conclusion slide because it says more or less the same thing. You can take a quick look. And I do hope that I'm not, um, that there are some people uh, around me still in the virtual space and we can have a nice uh, chat. Okay, so now, um, how do we, is, I'm not sure if Sylvia is uh, I am here. alive. Okay, great. So <laughs> at least sir. Sylvia, Christoph and Jonathan are here. And um, shall we move to the next stage of this uh, talk? Jonas, I don't think you have your video on, your, your audio on. Are you muted? Um, yes, yeah, shall we get some of the questions in? I'm going to maybe ask one from Vinoba. Um, Vino says, pardon me while I project my inner black mirror thoughts. It's interesting mm -hmm. that the holy, holy grail mentioned by Darren at the beginning is not an embodied neural implant. Why not an implant connected to everything around us? Mm -hmm. um, Christoph, do you want to address this one? Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I think, uh, my sense is that uh, BCI, medical BCI is going invasive. And uh, look, Elon Musk is, you know, is an interesting character, but uh, I don't think we should disrespect him uh, for being an interesting, uh, interesting character. And he's, yeah, he's going invasive. So definitely, you know, you can have your implant sign up for uh, the next uh, uh, human uh, study by Neuralase. And seriously, when Mark Zuckerberg uh, was asked, I think, what he said is, look, as Facebook, you don't want to imagine the congressional hearing when I say that Facebook is doing invasive, uh, you know, not only we're, uh, Facebook is, is following everything, we're just, you know, we're following thoughts. So I think Mark Zuckerberg would have gone uh, invasive if he wouldn't been afraid of the consequences. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I, don't see a, I don't see a big problem because I think we already have the problems, you know, the problems we have are not going to disappear or become greater because of implants. I think what we're probably gonna see is that these things will, again, will take time. We'll start with medical cases, which you can't argue with. Helping people, helping locked in patients, helping paralyzed patients. And after many years, this will be good enough. And maybe, you know, some generation will, will do it for, you know, cosmetic reasons or whatever. Just depending on the application, what you need for stroke rehabilitation, for example, you don't need a neural implant because the resolution on the surface is just good enough. Or for a locked in patient to communicate with the speller, you, you don't need an implant because the EG is again good enough. The other application like deep brain stimulation and Parkinson's <clears throat> disease where you have to implant something to stimulate the thalamus, of course. Uh, so it's just, just depending on the application what you need. Jonathan, do you want to share some of the questions? Yes, yes definitely. So we had a few um, comments regarding the fMRI part. Uh, one from uh, Katia that you know from, from the Amedi lab. And also okay, uh, another question and, and, and another one from uh, Mohassin Rashid, uh, who was asking, uh, uh, both of them were having some doubts regarding the uh, fMRI and wanted to know uh, in a bit, uh, if you, you can elaborate bit more on the method used to classify the signals and how it operates in general, the uh, uh, motor imagery, fMRI. Right. <clears throat> so I didn't have too much time to go into it, but basically um, you get the DICOM uh, image uh, from the brain uh, pre-processed very fast uh, with the several milliseconds, like a 50 millisecond delay. And uh, uh, the first step is to uh, reduce it from, I, I think it was something like 30,000, you know, or actually more. First of all, you, uh, using a simple threshold, you find the voxels that are in the brain uh, and not outside the brain or eyes or some stuff like that. We actually, we also, we uh, filtered the area of the eyes because we found that there's a lot of information uh, where you're looking at it. We didn't want to cheat. So we're left with pure brain. That's relatively easy. And then you're left with um, something like uh, 20,000 voxels, depends on the person. And uh, the fastest thing and the best thing was to do information game. So again, we, we, have, we need something like 40 uh, repetitions. 
Um, but after 40 repetitions, uh, the SVM and uh, tied to the information gain uh, finds, uh, you know, uh, voxels uh, that are, uh, most of them are really, really informative and they're in the places that you would expect them in a classical study, distinguishing, say, uh, left, right uh, imagery. There's, of course, difference between motor imagery and motor execution, which is very, very important and often uh, misunderstood. So, uh, of course, fMRI uh, allows you to, to look at all these things. So I'm not sure, again, what the questions are about, but, of course, you can find many details in uh, several papers written by, uh, with the first author is uh, Ori Cohen. Great, thank you. Uh, another interesting question that uh, came from uh, YouTube by uh, Thomas Wutkowski, uh, which is asking uh, regarding something we used to discuss about, about the connection between VR and uh, uh, ele uh, electrophysiology, specifically EMG on, and EOG, which uh, is basically, it's a natural method that uh, we can use for uh, maybe, uh, you know, BMI. Yeah, I, I want to address that because it relates to this neurochauvinism uh, message that I, I, I was going to make. And um, so basically, I understand. So, you know, in academia, it's very important for some of my colleagues who are, of course, uh, really good researchers. And it's very important to distinguish and to say whether this is a pure BCI versus, uh, and it's very important for them to insist that you're only using pure brain data in the interface. And I understand where that's coming from because you see too many misunderstandings, especially in industry. And you see a lot of videos on YouTube where people are controlling all kinds of things, but you know they're using actually muscle artifacts, right? Uh, to move things or to, to classify emotions. Uh, it's very easy to put uh, EEG electrodes and to detect uh, muscles, muscle activity and have an emotional classification. So I understand why in academia we try to be strict. But if you want to help people, if you want to have products and applications, then, you know, it's kind of ridiculous to separate. Again, it's this kind of uh, disembodiment uh, uh, trend, you know, maybe a consequence of the information revolution. Like say, the brain is here, body is here, let's throw away the body. No, of course, you should use a mixture of uh, channels. And whenever the easier channels do not work, yes, the EEG might, may help. I'm sure that you can build better solutions with a mixture of uh, signals. We had two ALS patients, technically savvy, uh, and they gave up using the, the BCI for communication. Again, uh, we can discuss in, uh, in depth with uh, Christoph, but even at, at the last days when they were almost completely locked in, they usually had one residual muscle, which they con could control and communicate using uh, eye tracking, uh, fa much faster than uh, uh, P300 BCI. They even tried uh, uh, Intendix or you know one of GTEC uh, products with uh, Nadav's help in Israel. Now, I'm not saying uh, BCI can't help anyone, but we see that pure BCI, I don't know, maybe Christoph, uh, do you actually see, uh, because you know maybe I'm wrong here and I would love to be corrected, do you actually see patients using uh, P300 spellers, for example, other than experiments? Of course, so, so we have a couple of clients or actually many clients using this speller for communication and it's a very useful extension of eye trackers and, and we always say twice to start as soon as possible so that you don't lose the ability in communication. Uh, some years ago, it was a big mistake that they got the brain computer interface when it was already too late. Mm -hmm. For that reason, you have to start as soon as possible. That's also the reason why we developed the unicorn brain interface, which is just much cheaper than Intendix before. And for that reason, it's also affordable for locked in patients and their families. And it's also much cheaper than the eye tracker. So an eye tracker for these patients is normally more than 10K. And the unicorn is 1K. So, so this is completely affordable for these patients and makes completely sense as a cognitive training environment besides the communication ability. Yeah, I remember the issue with the timing definitely when we were trying these things, but um, my sense was that um, the, as I would say the speed of communication, the satisfaction of the subjects. Um, don't you think, Christoph, that integrating a multimodal interface 
would uh, speed up uh, communication? You know, the, these patients are completely uh, locked in and, and they are desperate to find a solution. And even if they are still good, you know, they, they want to have different options. If they become completely locked in to have different options available, they just sleep better. If they know they have an eye track and also a BCI system available, if, if they become mm -hmm. completely locked in. And, and for that reason, it's just very good to give them different options and possibilities mm -hmm. for the futures when they are completely locked in. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question that uh, uh, from uh, Daniel Salamanca from the uh, panelists here, from, from the uh, audience on Zoom, who's asking, uh, what are the possibilities of using BCI in a low budget way? Uh, I'd like to uh, refer, like, uh, answer this shortly and also uh, give the one the, the, the option as well. And also, as Christoph just mentioned, uh, uh, GTEC uh, has uh, a low budget device, right? And we're also uh, familiar with the uh, OpenBCI platform from uh, the US, which uh, provides uh, experimental BCI operation using uh, an Arduino supported uh, platform and uh, 3D printed uh, um, head, headgear for, for the, the EEG, which is uh, very useful and uh, interesting to use. Um, and I really believe that when the technology will be available for most um, uh, use, use cases and not only research and uh, so on, we will have many more applications regarding that. Go on. And what are you, what were you trying to build with your students? Jonathan is the world champion in taking even non-technical social science students and uh, getting them to build uh, VR projects, uh, BCI projects. I don't know, let's think what we had in the last few years. Anyway, uh, well, I gave these examples with, uh, with the artists and the... Uh, yeah, yes, definitely. So if somebody is interested in, in doing some BCI, you should definitely try and see if you can came, uh, come across some uh, low cost devices from the, um, the Emotive, the, the, the Muse, maybe the OpenBCI platform. There, uh, oh, yeah, so there are many options. Um, another question from uh, Mohassin Rashid, who, who asked that, how can we understand brain is conscious or unconscious when we use BCI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't have time to go deeply into this, but of course, it's a very good question. So consciousness, of course, is a very uh, thorny issue. So, you know, depending on the context, uh, you need to define it very carefully. And indeed, of course, in the paper, uh, we don't call it consciousness to avoid all these misunderstandings. But I do believe that, um, I don't know if Christoph wants to tell, tell about this um, because, you know, um, but I heard a rumor, okay, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as they say, so someone said, maybe it's fake news, but imagine you could have a BCI control in your dreams, okay? So maybe it's fake news, but I heard uh, Christoph is uh, able to do this, or at least try to do this, and you can deny Christoph. But uh, again, so that would be clearly a different conscious state. I wouldn't call it unconscious, but a different conscious state. Um, and uh, so that's one example. Uh, if you can actually control uh, BCI in your sleep. Another example would be, for me, uh, the interesting thing, for example, in Jonathan's study is that, or in a study by Michal Ramot, is that we made sure 100% that the people were not aware that they are controlling something, okay? So whether you call it conscious, uh, unconscious, volitional, non-volitional, aware, unaware, um, yeah, that's what we that's what we're interested in. So we are using auditory and vibrotactile BCI paradigms to find out in coma patients or patients with disorders of consciousness if they have awareness and if they can follow conversations. So in, in this is simply done by putting EEG electrodes on and then we run different experimental paradigms like low and high tones, DD da, DD da, and we instruct the coma patient please count only the high tones. If we find a nice brain response, then we have a, 
very nice test if the patient was understanding it. And in the next phase, you can also go to communication. So you can ask him questions like, do you like the run? And did you study the IDC? And with the brain computer interface, the coma patient can answer. And if most of the questions are correctly answered, then you get a very objective proof that he's understanding you. So this is where I want very useful. Yeah. Sorry, this is where I want to ask you, uh, Christoph, I ask you the same question that I asked Adrian Owen, of course, who did one of these uh, first uh, studies. How do you know that the patient is conscious? Otherwise, he, he wouldn't be able to answer the questions. So we, we go from... But you know that you can answer questions uh, in your sleep, for example. Some people are able to. Well, we are testing common following and, and answering questions correctly. So if you answer 10 questions and you get eight, nine or 10 correct answers, that you, then you can assume that he is conscious. Well, I think we would agree that it's a, it's a challenging uh, question, but you know, in, in the, at least in the original, Adrian Owen, uh, so for those of you who don't know Adrian Owen, check him up. And I asked him like uh, in the original studies, it was very dramatic to find out that a lot of these coma patients were actually so-called conscious and I asked him, how do you know they're conscious? And he said, well, I asked them. One of the questions I asked is, are you conscious? And they said, yes. But again, this is all very, I agree with the question that was asked because, you know, um, we do know that uh, consciousness is a very elusive term and you can do all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things uh, during sleep or during altered, uh, alternate consciousness states. And, um, yeah, but from a practical point of view, uh, of course, uh, you are assuming that they are conscious. Anyway. Okay, shall I bring, um, do you have more questions? Uh, doesn't, uh, we have some questions on, on the YouTube, but they're very technical uh, regarding the devices and so on. Uh, there's one question is uh, regarding plasticity, which is uh, interesting to ask because uh, we know that uh, it takes time to practice uh, using BCI. And Doc Block uh, is asking, um, have, you, have we run studies for enough time to see that the brain adapts to our system, uh, which no longer recognize signals? I think that uh, it differs between the fMRI and, and EEG system, but uh, Christoph and Owen, I would love to hear your uh, thoughts about this. Can you repeat the question? The, the question regards the uh, plasticity effect that results in training using the systems. Brain plasticity. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at multitasking. Uh, Christoph, do you want to take that? So we use the brain compute interface recovery, for example, for stroke rehabilitation. So we place each G electrode over so the sensory motor cortex because they have, you know, uh, paralyzed limbs, hands or, or foot movements are paralyzed. And then we see with the brain computer interface training that brain plasticity is happening very nicely. So normally we train these stroke patients in 25 therapy sessions. Each one lasts 45 minutes. So in total, they have to train for 15 hours. And afterwards, we can just see very nicely that the uh, sensory motor cortex is getting active again, even for the uh, handicapped hand or handicapped leg. And this shows very nice brain plasticity with the EEG system. Um, there are also studies from Vivek in Madison, Wisconsin, in the USA. And he looked at FMI uh, pictures during the stroke rehabilitation training with PCIs. And you can also see these uh, brain plasticity effects in the FMI images very nicely. So yeah, I, I think now I understand the question. Um, I do want to, yeah, this is one of the things, one of the reasons I think fMRI should be more friendly, uh, part of the tools of the BCI community. And I, I suggest looking at a paper from, again, from Rafi's group. I think it was Tal Harmelech again, first author, which is called the day after effect. So basically uh, finding after a neurofeedback session, uh, a day after traces in resting state fMRI activity. Uh, so uh, uh, there are some very, and, and that was several years ago, I'm sure there's more coming out. So there are ways uh, to measure uh, this kind of uh, plasticity and to see the brain reorganizing. Uh, 
Great, and one last um, question from Robert Bellman, who, who is curious uh, to hear your thoughts on what do you think will be the most promising technological advances for the near future regarding BCI? Okay, here's where we should argue, but we won't. Um, <laughs> again, I have, seriously, I have the utmost respect for uh, Christoph uh, uh, and his work in uh, BCI, but uh, I am a little bit impatient so I would like to see uh, new signals. Again, uh, I would be very happy to be proven wrong and to show, and if uh, Christoph and other very excellent people in the field who are moving very, very slowly, step by step, squeezing uh, what you can get from EG and really make a difference in people's lives. And, and it is happening uh, in Christoph's uh, products, but um, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm impatient and I'm, I think, I'm really hoping that some biophysicists, um, this is again, not me, my, my background is more mathematical, algorithmical, uh, come up with, with breakthroughs in, in channel, in, in uh, brain information. Um, yeah. It's actually very simple. So what you need is closed loop experiments. So you have to provide brain stimulation or full body stimulation, like functional electrical stimulation to close the loop. And besides measuring the EG and extracting your brain waves, you, you have to feed it back. And we have just seen it with recoveries, with this stroke rehabilitation. When we put in the functional electrical stimulation, then we get this pairing of cognitive processes with functional improvements and motor movements. And that, that's just a simple reason why we have the closed loop brain uh, body and stimulation of course, experiment. Of course, that's the reason for using BCI with VR. That's that's why we all, we started all these things in Presentia. So definitely on that, of course, we agree about uh, closed loop, sensory motor, closed loop, uh, uh, feedback, uh, definitely multi-sensory, definitely. On that note, I'm going to bring back Mel, who will give a wrap up. Uh, first of all, it's Mel's fault. You know, I wouldn't have, well, <laughs> I don't think I would have gone into this, well, anyway. And Mel is the one who introduced me to this field and to uh, good friends like Christoph Guger. So uh, Mel, your thought, please. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, this journey started off in 2002 when we started this Presencia project and this involved uh, uh, Doron, Christoph Guger, Perchula and many others or several others. And then we carried on in another project and it's fascinating to hear um, how far it's come and also how far it needs to go. So thanks to Doron, uh, Jonathan and Christoph for presenting uh, this work today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Sylvia. And to Sylvia, yes, for always being the producer behind the scenes. And I only want to finish by saying um, the next meeting the next seminar will be by, by Mar Gonzalez Franco on the 4th of June, that's this Thursday at six o'clock CEST, that's Brussels, Brussels time or Paris or Berlin. So I hope uh, you'll be joining us again on, on Thursday at 6 p.m. So thanks very much. Thank you all. Okay, Bye. thank you. I'm gonna stop the